A new version of Salem's Lot is on Max, and people are falling in love with this property all over again. Not really. No, actually, it's not being well received. I reviewed it a few days ago. Was not a fan. And today I'm gonna break down exactly why in a spoiler-filled video. Come on, let's let's head there now. Before I begin, if you wouldn't mind grabbing a steak and just whoosh, taking out that subscribe button really fast, it just takes a second. I also say button instead of button. I can't, I, I feel like I'm overpronouncing when I try to compensate for my lack of T sound. But yeah, there's a button down there, just stake it. Film fires up in the small town of Jerusalem, simply known as Salem's Lot. Fancy pants Mr. Straker is at his establishment and he's talking to one of his colleagues. He wants it to retrieve a mysterious crate at 6 p.m. tonight and they're going to drop it off in the cellar. No questions asked. Don't look inside. It's for Straker's eyes only. That night, Mustachio Man and his partner take the crate down into the cellar. They bump into a bunch of crap, even though for us, the audience, it's very bright down there because they're using that shitty day-to-night filter. The crate falls down, it breaks open, and these two don't stick around to see what's inside. Not a particularly scary or exciting way to start the film, but that's going to be setting the table perfectly for the movie we're about to endure. All right, it's the next day now. Sundown by Gordon Lightfoot is playing. This is the best thing about the film. The song is an absolute jam. Sundown, you better take care. I don't, I can't sing it, obviously, but it's, it's a great song. And the movie knows it because not only are we starting, but we're also ending with the same thing. The main protagonist of the film, Ben, is going to be driving through his old stomping grounds, checking out the small, quaint shops, some of the locals in the areas. Going to get pulled over by a cop who's the dude from Mist. Typically, he plays kind of a redneck, so it's odd seeing him as an authority figure, but his character is pretty much useless all the way throughout. No real reason to even go into any more detail about that guy. He heads over to L. Crockett's insurance and real estate building, where he's going to be greeted by an adult-sized version of Tinkerbell. Pixie cuts at the front desk, she's reading his book, and, um, she's not a fan. They find him a lovely B&B to stay at over on Railroad Street. Why come back, though, to this town after all these years? What's his angle? I think he's trying to find himself. We don't get a whole lot more detail on that because this movie is running so fast to get through this book. There's just no time to focus on this guy. The, the lead character. At a nearby school, Homelander's boy is getting into a little scuffle with the town douchebag. New kid Mark gets sucker punched to the ground. But this bully has no idea who he's fucking with! Four Eyes gets up, absolutely bodies this kid. This scene establishes two things. Number one, Stephen King thinks that all bullies are one second away from shooting up a school. And two, new kid on the block, Mark Petrie, is not to be trifled with. And yes, his last name is Petrie. I kept waiting for Littlefoot and Sarah to show up from the land before time, but alas, it never happens. Uh, you know what? Scratch that. Not Sarah. She's a bitch. Uh, let's bring in Ducky instead. Ben, now at the local library, is combing through the microfiche. Library Karen is checking him out from a distance, gabbing it up with the other ladies. Apparently, he has a very sad history with the town. You know what? That probably would have been an interesting thing to see play out on film, not told through a couple lines of dialogue, and then it's glossed over like it's nothing. Side note, this woman is whispering at a deafening level. She's basically screaming in whisper. <laughs> An old man with a hearing impairment could hear this conversation from three blocks away. Now at Mark's place, he's talking with his nerdy friends about Houdini. One of the kids randomly plays a harmonica one time for no reason. He pulls it out of his pocket, blows on it, and that's done. You know what? I mean, there is a reason for the movie to show it because later on we're going to hear this harmonica and it's going to be oh that kid harmonica kid he played that that that's him again but in terms of what's happening in the scene it felt really out of place ben and tinkerbell are now at the hottest ticket in town the drive-in movie theater i feel the sparks between these two kids i can't wait to see where this goes homelander jr and harmonica joe are walking home from mark's place this looks to be an eight mile hike sun's getting real low big guy this is the walk your grandparents always complained about doing when they were kids back in their day. Hopefully they didn't have a creepy gentleman pull up to them on the side of the road like these two did. That's right, Straker's back, baby. And he wants to see if these kids want to ride. In the most creepy way possible. 
I don't even know his end game here. Is he just screwing with them? Or did he genuinely think he was being convincing? Like, hey, uh, why don't you two uh, hop in the car? I can give you a ride home. Hmm, this is working. I'm selling this. I'm normal. They naturally decline as he asks them this question in the most pedophilistic way possible. It appears the boys could not casually disregard this offer as they would be making their way through the woods and, oh, there he is, Straker's back, and Harmonica Joe is kidnapped. Unfortunately, Harmonica won't make it home that night as that creepy thing that was in the coffin is Barlow, the owner of the establishment, and he's hungry. Back at his place, Homelander Jr. is about ready to hit the sack and then go to bed. That harmonica goes off, Ralphie's in the front yard. Junior <laughs> looks out the window, doesn't really see anything except for a teeter-totter, so he's, of course, gonna walk outside in the middle of the night by himself. Not the smartest thing, and BAM! He gets harmonica Gets himself pulled into the hospital something fierce. Unfortunately, the boy did not have access to mother's milk, and he doesn't make it through the night. He did attempt to grab the bag and drink blood out of it. He had the right idea, but not the tools necessary. Typically, after a funeral procession is completed, procession short for procession, the grave digger will fill in the grave again. He'll put the dirt that he took out and he'll, he'll put it back in the, the hole that was made. Unfortunately, this young gentleman decided to pass out for several hours against a tree. It happens. Happens to the best of the grave diggers out there. So he's gonna have to fill this thing in after hours. Peekaboo, says the young boy, flies out of the grave, takes out his first victim. We're now at the hometown pub where grave digger Mike is lurking in the shadows, hiding in the corner, while uh, the teacher guy that showed up once earlier in the film, he's there too, putting out the vibes. He recognizes Mike in the corner, he feels bad, he looks very sick, not well at all, and he offers to take him back to his place, put him in bed for the night, get some nice shut-eye. And the teacher notices a couple of marks on the side of the neck. Naturally, the first thing he assumes is vampire. You know, that's where everybody leaps to for the first conclusion. He informs Ben and Tinkerbell, who he's apparently friends with, that's news to me, and they come over to the place as well. They also bring over a doctor who examines the boy, determines he's dead. That's a shame. Maybe don't sleep on the job and this wouldn't have happened. Meanwhile, Mark is busy becoming a vampire buster. After using a cross on Homelander Jr. who showed up at his parents' place, he has decided to start making some rules for how to fight these things. This kid is like 11, and somehow he and the teacher came to the same conclusion at the same time that the vampires originated at Barlow's place, and they happened to meet up right there in the cellar. And Straker locks them down there. How are they possibly going to get out of this one? Well, they really don't. The teacher's taken out, and Mark is bound up, taken upstairs where he's suspended from the ceiling. <laughs> Good luck getting out of this one, sir. I've seen grown-ass adults who have no way to fight off a tight rope with no help. Oh, he's out. He got out on his own. That's nice. This kid's the Terminator. We're gonna get back to him in a second, but in perhaps the stupidest funny part of the movie, one of the victims comes back to life during an autopsy. To stop the creature, our leads start looking around everywhere for crosses. They don't find any, but oh, there's tongue depressors. All we have to do is tape them in a cross-like manner, and that'll work exactly the same. And it does. What? All right, back to Mark. He's now unchained, unbound, unshackled, and he's pissed. Straker comes around the corner. Mark's ready for him, grabbing, I think, a fire poker, and... <laughs> takes two swift hits to kill this man. Marcus, at 11 years old, has killed someone already, and he doesn't seem the least bit bothered with it. Sometimes you kill a man, and you just don't care cause it's part of God's plan. Fucking hilarious. After double tapping this poor bastard, he heads to the church. Doesn't head home, doesn't head to the authorities, he just goes to the church, he has a feeling, I guess. I got this feeling. Good instincts, too. The other people are at the church already. Mark busts through the door like he's Sarah Connor, and he knows they have to take out Barlow. Tinkerbell wants to stop by her place quick to warn her mother of what's going on, so she and Ben go over there, only to find, in the dumbest reveal of the film, that her mom, at some point, became Team Barlow. 
She's wearing a Mava hat, Make America Vampire again. She's fully invested in the cult. Yeah, I guess she fell for Barlow and she's now his servant. Tink is incredibly taken aback by this, along with the rest of the audience, because we've met her mom, I think, one other time. Yeah, I, she's been busy behind the scenes. So ridiculous. Oh, also, there's another vampire randomly in the house already. Pops out from the hallway and bites Tinkerbell right on the neck. And then he's like, ah, the sun. Oh, this wasn't a great idea. What an absolute shit show. Now, it was established right away in the film, one time, kind of, that Barlow maybe has magical abilities to put people in a trance, you know, using the, the glimmer or whatever that's called that vampires sometimes have, depending on what material we're working off of. But it's never, like, explained. It's never shown again. So, yeah, maybe her mom's under a spell or a trance of sorts. Never said. And she just watched her daughter get her neck freaking bit into didn't face her one iota. Sometimes you're under a spell. Mark's parents are just as stupid and they're taken out by other vampires lickety split. Naturally, Marcus locks himself in his impenetrable treehouse for the night. After what I would imagine was a wild 10 to 12 hours, the sun comes up and there are now only three survivors left in the entire town. We don't see this feeding though. We don't see these vampires running amok, taking out all the townspeople. It's just a big shock. Everyone's been killed, turned. And where are they? That's the big question. Where are they hiding? Well, the vampires have determined in their infinite wisdom that the best place to sleep for the night is in the trunks of their own car. Out in the parking lot of that popular drive-in theater. I told you it was popular. It's the happening place to be. Ben, Marcus, and Dr. Cody figured this out. They came to that conclusion on their own, and so they're gonna head there, try to find Barlow, and end this nightmare. The first trunk of a car Ben opens, naturally Tinkerbell's, she's sleeping one off, just trying to get some shut-eye, but Dr. Cody's like, I'll take care of this bitch. She goes in for a stab, but boom! She shotgunned in the back by Tink's mom. Who is this woman? Why is she the only sycophant who's running around doing these things? Chaos ensues as the vampires start waking up because the sun has now gone behind the giant screen at the drive-in. Don't worry, 11 and a quarter year old Mark is on the case. He jumps in a car, Tokyo drifts his ass underneath the screen, taking out each individual beam that's holding this thing up. Perfectly hits all of them, at 11 mind you, who barely can see over the steering wheel, and the screen goes down, taking out every vampire along the way. Not even Dominique Toretto could drive as well as this kid did. Wow, I... Holy crap, I apologize to Vin Diesel and Dominic. Obviously, Toretto could do this. He could do this blindfolded. That was way too much. Final boss battle. They find Barlow's coffin inside the back of a truck. They get it out, but it's too late. The sun has gone down. He's now at full strength. Fun fact for you, Barlow backwards is Walrab which is meaningless, just like this film. Barlow makes his big screen debut, coming off looking like a cross between Marilyn Manson and a rejected design from Blade Two, or something you would find at a Spirit Halloween in the bargain bin section. Barlow jumps on top of some metal. He's looking down at Mark. This might be game over for the kid. I can't imagine how he's gonna get out of- Ben stakes Barlow right through the mouth. No, that's not a euphemism. And we do get one cool shot here where the camera looks through the mouth and we see Ben on the other side like, Hey! <laughs> ben and Mark have done it. They saved the day. Sure, the townspeople are all dead, but they did stop this gross infection, whatever this is, from spreading to other neighboring communities. And much like Houdini, these two make their wonderful escape out of this town once and for all. They drive off to the musical stylings of Gordon Lightfoot playing them away. Salem's art, what a pile of shit. You'd be much better if you just skipped it. Well, there you have it, my play-by-play -play of Salem's Lot to my best recollection. What a experience this was. I'd love to hear from you in the comments. Let me know if you sat through this drivel, this dreck, this waste of time, or if you have fond memories of the 70s miniseries in your mind still. Maybe it scarred you as a youngling and you don't want to go back. Please, again, think about subscribing to the channel. You just have to hit that thing down there. It's under the video. Hit the notification bell too, because then these videos will actually show up in your feed. 
You can like the video, do all that stuff the algorithm likes, and hopefully I catch you next time. Take care.